Hey everybody, what's going on? It's episode 39 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and today we're going to talk about Bruce Lee. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also Whistlekick's founder. And here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories, all for traditional martial artists. Thanks to everyone tuning in again, and thank you to any of the new folks checking us out for the first time. Don't forget, you can find all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests on the show. Just a few days ago, we recorded the episode that we've talked about a few times with a man that goes by the name of Rabbi G. He's the founder, the black belt founder of the organization Kids Kicking Cancer that we've been talking about on social media and I think actually on a couple podcast episodes. Let me just say it was a really powerful episode. I'm super excited to see it come out. And right now that's scheduled for December 14th. So watch for that. Today's episode, like I said, is all about Bruce Lee, the man that I would say has had more of an impact on the martial arts than any other person. But hang on a second, and we'll get into that discussion shortly. So like I said, you know, we make stuff here at Whistlekick, and that includes some awesome sweatshirts. Comfortable. They come in five colors, like the cozy red one I've got on right now. Uh, pocket in the front, big hood, logo on the front, and our great, really popular slogan on the back, never settle. So why don't you hit up whistlekick.com, check them out. We've got free shipping on everything over there and help support the show. So, let's talk about Bruce Lee. And let's skip all the standard bio stuff, you know, how, where he was born and all that, because that's really easy to find out. What I want to talk about today is more who Bruce Lee was and how he got there, and really, as a result of all of that, how he had the impact on the martial arts that he has. So, let's imagine it's the mid to late 1950s, Bruce Lee's living in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is not like it is today, at least as far as everything I've read. It was kind of a rough place, you know, the, the British occupation and everything, and there was a lot of gang activity, and Bruce Lee kept getting into fights. So he was losing these fights, and at 16, he started training in Wing Chun at a school under Yip Man, the great Yip Man. And of course, we've talked about him on the show and the movies, uh, Ip Man movies based on his life somewhat loosely. But then the other students started to find out that Bruce Lee's mom wasn't fully Asian. She was part German, if I remember correctly. And because of that, there was a lot of prejudice. They didn't want to work with him to the point where Bruce Lee really didn't have much of a chance to train. And so Yip Man realizes what's going on, sees Bruce Lee's dedication, and takes him on personally and starts training with him, uh, sparred with Bruce Lee. And just to give you an idea of that, I mean, just that this is something, I don't think there's anyone in America today that would be regarded as highly in martial arts as Yip Man was at that time in Hong Kong. So this was incredibly influential on Bruce Lee and it, so much so that I would argue that if this hadn't happened, he would not have had the quality of education that he did and may not have risen to the skill level that he did so early, so quickly. So despite all of that, Bruce keeps getting into fights, and it gets to a point where he actually beats up the son of a gang leader, and there's all this drama that's about to unfold, and one of the police officers comes to his dad and says, you know, I'm going to have to put him in jail if we don't do something. So his dad says, forget this, Bruce, you're going to America. And this was all right around the time, not only was Bruce Lee training in martial arts in Wing Chun, but he was dancing, and it was quite common at that time in Hong Kong for young men and young women to learn to dance as a way to meet people and to date and things like that. And in 1958, Bruce Lee was um, a cha-cha champion in Hong Kong, so I thought that was kind of neat. We talked about that on episode 38 with Master Penizo. 
which was in part what kicked off me doing some research and what brought about this episode. So Bruce Lee's in America, does his thing, goes to college, drops out, teaches some martial arts. But then in 1964, Ed Parker invites him to come out to the Long Beach Karate International Karate Championships. I probably I have the word karate in there twice, but you know what I mean. And this was where he first demonstrated that one inch punch in a major public venue. And the poor guy to take the punch was this guy named Bob Baker, who said later on, he, he asked Bruce Lee, he said, please don't ever demonstrate that on someone again. It was just, the pain was unbearable. I had to miss work. It was really, really rough. A few years later, 1967, at the same event, this was the time that Bruce Lee and now Grandmaster Victor Moore met up. And you can listen to Grandmaster Moore's side of all of this exchange. Back on episode 20, we interviewed him. And it's a great episode. He goes into quite a bit of detail about this moment. And this was the point where Bruce Lee had just started into the movies and they're trying to portray him as this amazing martial artist with tremendous speed. And so Grandmaster Moore was the one that was picked to work with Bruce Lee and supposedly uh, not be able to block anything that Bruce would throw. And of course, from the martial artists that I've spoken with that were there or their accounts, most of them are saying that Bruce Lee was not as fast as he was represented to be, that Grandmaster Moore was able to block anything that came anywhere near him. And then, of course, the Bruce Lee camp represented it very differently. So there's some video out there. It's a little vague. You can check it out. Uh, probably throw it up on the show notes, uh, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But whatever it was, it was a pretty important exchange because here we are 50 years later, right? Almost 50 years later, and we're still talking about it. So it was that same year, 1967, Bruce Lee got into this really famous fight with a guy in San Francisco named Wong Jack Mann, and Bruce felt that the fight took too long, and he really started looking at his Wing Chun and saying, you know, this maybe there's some stuff here that needs to be adjusted. It's too rigid. It's too traditional. And that's where the roots of Jeet Kune Do came out. So beyond that, he also started training physically very differently. He started approaching um, cardiovascular fitness, you know, running a lot and weight training, things of that nature. And he felt that martial artists needed to spend more time training physical fitness, that as a discipline, we were too entrenched in training the art and not so much training the body or the mind. Of course, Bruce Lee wrote a fair amount on philosophy and went to school for philosophy. But one of the things I found interesting as I was doing my research and really trying to bring in some stuff that hopefully you all don't know about Bruce Lee was his emphasis on nutrition and that he was eating a low carb, high protein diet, even in the mid to late sixties. And this was the same time that Dr. Atkins, the guy who promoted the Atkins diet, wrote his first book. So he's way ahead of the curve there. And I think that that speaks a lot to his whole attitude. Bruce Lee was Obviously, I never met him. He passed before I was born. But from everything I've read and understood about him, there was some. there's a common thread in that he never accepted the status quo. And that's kind of an interesting dynamic for us as traditional martial artists that we're handed down these tools, these martial arts forms, techniques, and we value the traditionalism of them. But that's a catch-22 because how do things evolve without changing? And I'm not going to get into that here, but clearly for Bruce Lee, it was important not to accept things simply as they were, simply for the traditionalism of them. And that's how he founded Jeet Kune Do, and that's his approach, his view of a lot of other things. 
1969, he did some choreography for a film called The Wrecking Crew, which, if you dig in, is actually Chuck Norris's first movie role. And it's uncredited on the movie, but if you look at IMDb, it's listed there pretty plainly. And I found some other supporting evidence. So that's pretty cool. Even though Bruce Lee had less than 15 years of real impact on the martial arts world, he's probably had, and I would say he's had, the most influence of any individual in modern times on martial arts. If you go back, if you listen to the episodes of Martial Arts Radio, he's the most given answer for who people would want to train with. And if you look at the t-shirts that people wear that feature martial artists, yeah, some of them have Chuck Norris on them. Some of those people wear them ironically, you know, with his, uh, his memes and, you know, the, all the jokes that are made of Chuck Norris. But the other person on those shirts is Bruce Lee. And his movies transcend martial arts. There are a ton of people, a large percentage of people that never trained in martial arts that watch Bruce Lee movies. Enter the Dragon is a movie that I would say most people over the age of 40 have seen, whether or not they've trained in martial arts. So why? And that's really the question here. Why did he have such an impact? And I think there are several factors going on here. First off, he was good at what he did. Whether or not he was the best, whether he was the best fighter, the best anything, I don't think that really matters. I think that he was good enough that he was impressive to people. Even martial artists would watch him and say, he was good. People that didn't do martial arts would watch him and say, he's good. And I think that's an important distinction. He was the first martial artist that I think most of America was exposed to. He was the first one that's really was all over TV and movies and made a career of being a martial artist in front of the camera. And then third, he died at a really young age. And here in America, we really tend to lift up and idolize celebrities that have passed at an age that we would say is, is too early. John Belushi, Elvis, um, you know, I'm sure you can think of a whole bunch more. But And since Bruce Lee, we haven't had anybody come along that has taken martial arts, at least its public image, and moved it forward in the way that Bruce Lee did. At the time he came in, the general population in America didn't really know martial arts. They might have had some minor exposure to it. They might have heard about it. But it went from zero to 100 because of Bruce Lee. Everyone knew what martial arts was, at least in their own eyes. And we've had plenty of stars since then, Jackie Chan, Chuck Norris. But when people talk about them, they don't talk about what they've done in the martial arts. They don't talk about the one-inch punch. They don't talk about these amazing kicks. They talk about them as celebrities as martial arts actors, the acting part being first and foremost. Um, you know, unfortunately, anyone that does have their martial arts discussed tends to have it discussed in a very critical way because that's where we are. We tend to tear down our celebrities these days, Steven Seagal being the best, uh, I think, example of that. And I don't think there's going to be another Bruce Lee at any point because martial arts is really mature now everybody's trained in martial arts or they know a dozen people that have trained in martial arts and that mystique that was there when Bruce Lee first came to television and movies is gone. And of course his death is sad. We don't know what other amazing things he might have done had he lived longer. But it's also part of the reason that we hold him in the regard that we do. We as martial artists have Bruce Lee as a legend in part because of his early death. So those are my thoughts. Really welcome yours. And of course, it wouldn't be right. It's the Bruce Lee episode. And of course, movie pick every week. This week's an obvious choice, Enter the Dragon. Some of you may not know, Bruce Lee helped write Enter the Dragon. And the film takes place in Hong Kong and really was instrumental in launching the careers for both Sammo Hung and Jackie Chan, who made an appearance in the film. And it was so significant, 
not just for them, but for American culture and worldwide culture, that in 2004 it was included in the National Film Registry at the Library of Congress. So I'm going to guess most of you have seen Enter the Dragon. Big bunch of you probably have it on VHS. You might ha be still be carrying around a VCR so you can watch movies like that or you know, some DVD, maybe there's even a Blu-ray release, I don't know. Um, but go watch it, remember how great it was the first time you saw it, and take some of this new information about Bruce Lee, and maybe it gives you some new context. So thanks for tuning in to this Bruce Lee episode. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, links to the things that I talked about here today. Sign up for the newsletter. Remember, this is episode 39. So head on over there. And give us some comments on what you thought about this episode. Obviously, this is a different format than the last few Thursday episodes. Tell me what you thought. So, And if there's some great Bruce Lee fact or reference that I missed in the show, definitely let us know, and we'll put that out there too. So if you haven't already, go ahead, leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're downloading the show. That's really important to help our growth. And don't forget the free apps on Google Play and the App Store. Just search for Whistlekick. Head on over to whistlekick.com. Check out the sweatshirts. Uh, those are even on sale right now. And that's it. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.